measures to promote and protect public health, safety, and welfare by ensuring high standards in the practice of pharmacy and through effective regulation of the manufacture and distribution of drugs. I will now call the roll for board and staff. For the record, when I call your name, please verbally acknowledge here. Board President Ian Doyle here. Board Vice President Kat Chin here. Board Member Shannon Beeman here. Board Member Rachel DeBarmore has an excused absence. Board Member Jennifer Hall here. Board Member Rosemarie Hemmons here. Board Member Rich Joyce here. Board Member Priyal Patel here. Board Member Cindy Vipperman here. Chief Compliance Officer Joe Ball here. Pharmacist Consultant Jennifer Davis here. Compliance Director Brianne Efremoff here. Executive Director Jamal T. Fox here. Office Manager Naomi Graham here. Licensing Manager Chrissy Hennigan here. Administrative Director Karen McLean here. Operations <coughs> Policy Analyst Rachel Melvin here. Staff Member Joe Schnabel here. I just have to pause. That sounds really weird. Sorry. <laughs> uh, board Council Joanna Tucker Davis. Uh, President Pivotal, President of Pivotal Resources Pete Pandy here. Facilitator with P Pivotal Resources Vashti Boyce here. Facilitator with Pivotal Resources Brittany Sale here. With regards to public comment, there will be an opportunity for public comment on Thursday, November 9th. 2023 at 1 p.m. The board will not deliberate any issues or requests during public comment, such as formal requests, issues currently under investigation, requests pending before the board, or currently proposed rules. To sign up to provide public comment, please email your request to pharmacy.board at bop.oregon.gov by 10 a.m. on Thursday, November 9th, 2023 or sign up using the sign up sheet by the door. Some comments uh, with regards to housekeeping and uh, meeting etiquette. Board and staff, please identify yourself as board or staff, nating, staff member preceding your last name each time you speak. Please silence your personal devices. It's extremely important that all board members speak one at a time and directly into the microphone. Please limit side conversations as they interfere with the recording that we must do. The microphones are these discs uh, in front of you strung along like uh, Christmas lights. Um, they uh, might have more difficulty picking up uh, the sound as we speak uh, compared to our normal microphones that we have in the office. So we just wanna make sure to speak clearly and uh, one at a time. Raise your hand when you have questions or comments, please. Uh, sorry, you will be called on as quickly as possible. Several round robins will be conducted to facilitate discussion. We will enable each member to have their turn first turn to speak and then conduct a second round uh, or ask for raised hands if you have comments to make. Uh, please do not interject statements until being called upon. Pivotal, pivotal resources will be orienteering the majority of the round robin discussions. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and retained for public record keeping purposes. Please note that there may be times this meeting in which the board will divide into small groups and it may be difficult for virtual attendees to hear. For the public in the room, we require that you add your name to the sign-in sheet located at the entrance. We will break for lunch around 12.20 p.m. and ask the public leave the room at that time. Uh, we will now review and approve the agenda. I, Board Member Doyle, move to approve the agenda. Board Vice President Chin, second. Board Member Beeman, yes. Board Member Hall? Board Member Hall, yes. Board Member Hemmons? Yes. Board Member Joyce? Yes. Board Member Patel? Yes. Board Member Viverman? Yes. Uh, motion passes with um, Board Member DeBarmore absent. 
We now transition into welcome and introductions. Could I just do a housekeeping? This is staff member McLean. Could I do a quick housekeeping? Yes, please. So welcome everybody. I hope everybody got here safely. Um, just for everybody's information, the restrooms are right out this door and to the left on the other side of the lobby area. There's also a water filter. If you brought your own water bottle and you'd like to fill your water bottle, you can. There's gonna be refreshments and water, coffee, tea in the back of the room throughout the meeting. Um, everyone is welcome, including our public guests to walk around the um, aquarium. So that is included in our in our stay here for the next two days. Um, let's see, restrooms, aquarium, hot water, tea. So if you need anything, please let me know. If we don't have something, we'll work on getting it accommodated. Thank you so much. Thank you, staff member McLean. Uh, board member Doyle speaking again. Uh, the Oregon Board of Pharmacy is pleased to welcome the agency's new executive director, Jamal T. Fox. Jamal has more than 20 years of experience in the public and private sectors and recently served as city manager for the city of Tacoma Park in Maryland. Prior to Tacoma Park, he served as city administrator for the city of Camas, Washington. He also served as deputy chief of staff to the mayor of Portland, Oregon, and was the city of Portland Parks and Property, Parks, Property and Business Development Manager. Jamal was appointed by Governor Brown to the Oregon Commission on Black Affairs, where he ultimately was elected chair for several years. Prior to relocating to the Pacific Northwest, Jamal worked in the city manager's office and in the planning and de community development department in the city of Greensboro, North Carolina. At the age of 25, Mr. Fox became the youngest person to ever be elected and serve uh, on the Greensboro City Council representing District 2, that being Northeast Greensboro. He was also a former adjunct professor in political science at North Carolina A&T State University and has worked as a pharmacy technician and manager in a community pharmacy. Jamal has a master's of public administration degree from Capella University and a bachelor of arts degree in political science from North Carolina A&T State University. Fox is married with two children and is a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Jamal brings experience that translates well to the Board of Pharmacy's mission to promote, preserve, and protect the public health, safety, and welfare by ensuring high standards in the pharmacy, in the practice of pharmacy, and by regulating the quality, manufacture, sale, and distribution of drugs. Jamal started his new role with the agency on October 20. 5th, 2023. The board, agency staff, partners, and stakeholders welcome Jamal to the helm and at the same time thank outgoing director Joseph Schnabel for his leadership throughout his tenure. I now uh, pass the floor to uh, new executive director Fox. Thank you, board president Doyle, uh, for sharing uh, some of my background. It's a distinct pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to both meet all of you in person, as well as to participate in this important direction setting working session for the Board of Pharmacy. The timing has worked out perfectly, and being here will be a big help in transitioning into my new role. I'm very happy and proud to have been chosen as your executive director for the Board of Pharmacy. It's an important responsibility to help ensure all areas of pharmacy can meet the healthcare needs of all Oregonians and do so in a way that is safe, ethical, and accessible to everyone. It's important to recognize the important contributions and achievements of my predecessor, Joe Snabel. Not only has Joe helped the board make progress on a variety of important priorities, but he's also been highly praised for guiding the board and all of Oregon through the COVID emergency. Pharmacy is not known for being the fast moving discipline for good reasons in most cases, but for the pandemic, it required a very rapid response as well as close coordination with other agencies and providers and Joe played a pivotal role in ensuring the board and staff met that challenge. I think he deserves a round of applause for his service and accomplishments. So please join me in 
And having Joe here today is just another benefit to me uh, as we pass, as he passes the baton to me to carry on in, in the next iteration of the Board of Pharmacy for the state of Oregon. Today marks two weeks since I officially started in this position. And as you can imagine, uh, I've been drinking from a fire hydrant, mm -hmm. a huge fire hydrant uh, since then. And I still have plenty to learn. And all of you I've spoken with so far have been very valuable in helping me understand the current situation and challenges facing the board and the practice of pharmacy in Oregon. These challenging times for the pharmacy profession, achieving the board's mission is not easy when safe practice conditions are threatened, when there is a shortage of people entering the profession, and when we're trying to enhance regulation and compliance while allowing innovative solutions to the needs of diverse patients and communities. <laughs> What I'm hoping to bring to the Board of Pharmacy is a renewed energy and commitment to address these issues by ensuring that we serve both as an effective regulatory agency and a supporter of new ideas and practices. As we update and enforce new rules to ensure patient safety, we must focus equally on service to and support for our licensees so they can do their jobs and meet the needs of their customers. One of the great things about this meeting is the opportunity to work together to clarify these commitments and priorities to strengthen our teamwork and make our efforts more inclusive, productive, equitable, and successful. So I'm really looking forward to continuing to get to know you all better and do what I can to not only support the work you've done, but help respond even more effectively and efficiently to the needs of pharmacy practice across the state. Thank you, President Doyle, for allowing me this opportunity to share a few thoughts. And if there's any questions, I can take any questions. None. Turn it back over to you, President Doyle. Thank you. Uh, I now will defer to uh, facilitator Pete Pandy to take us into our first set of activities. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Doyle. And um, what we're going to do now is, um, sorry, facilitator Pandy speaking, um, get some introductions from everybody here around the table. Um, we don't have ton of time, but we want to hear something interesting about everybody. We don't get a chance to have a little more time to um, interact in a typical meeting. So this is our chance to learn about each other a little bit more than just um, name, rank, and serial number. So what we'd like to do is um, and we'll just go around the room and um, you know, get you simple. Um, your name, what's your current position, a little background on your career. Um, what is it's an objective or aspiration that you personally have for this meeting. And then one interesting or boring fact about yourself, <laughs> just to help people learn a little bit about, you know, who's behind the the uh, nameplate in front of the in front of you on the table. Um, and we'll just learn about each other this way. So I think, as I say, we'll go around the table and we'll begin with um, operations policy analyst Melvin. Thank you. Uh Staff member Melvin, uh, again, operations policy analyst too with the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, I have been with the Board of Pharmacy since 2016, and I come from a corporate background. I worked for an enterprise rent-a-car as an area sales manager for about 13 years of my career. Um, I aspiration for the outcome of this meeting is just. Uh, maybe some renewed interests, some new directives from the board, some consensus on where we're going. Exciting. And a personal fact about me, um, I collect vintage vinyl records. I have quite the collection and I am obsessed with finding really mint condition vinyl, especially from the seventies. So I have a lot of Eagles records and yeah. Wow. Thank you. Um, 
My name's Ian Doyle. Um, my current position is that I serve as Associate Dean for Pharmacy Practice at Pacific University School of Pharmacy. I've been there at Pacific for 13 years. Um, started my uh, career 30 years ago um, as a pediatrics pharmacist and have um, a long variety of different um, avenues and that's the one thing that I've most cherished about this profession is that the <laughs> one's ability to be involved in so many different aspects of of um, serving uh, the public and the new learners of tomorrow. Um, my uh, objective uh, here is to uh, be a, a, I guess a facilitator of of um, of uh, energy and uh, hoping I see uh, uh, starting transitionary period between Joe and Jamal and uh, try to uh, help Jamal uh, best fit in or to to be the best fit into this meeting <clears throat> again to help him with that fire hose problem that he noted. <laughs> cool. um, and a personal uh, fact about me is that I my favorite sport is triathlon, and I've been involved in swimming, biking, and running uh, since 1996. Wow. Good morning, everyone. I am a staff member, Brianne Efremoff. I am currently the compliance director at the Board of Pharmacy and have been in this um, been with the board for about 10 years now. Previously was an investigator and a life way back before that, um, a community pharmacist. And um, something aspirational or objective of this meeting, really just to listen and to learn, um, hopefully to get a good sense of um, where the board is, where the board's looking to go, um, so that I can start thinking from the perspective of how we we how we create goals or objectives within um, kind of the metrics or how we, how we function in the compliance department more specifically from my lens. So that's what I'm hoping to learn. Um, one personal fact about me, you guys are way more interesting than me. Um, I'm just gonna share, I really love the outdoors and nature. I really like hiking um, and just being able to bird watch and animal watch. So this is a wonderful venue for me. So thank you. All right, um, my name is Rich Joyce. Um, I'm going on to my fourth year as a board member. My uh, my experience has been primarily in the inpatient side of pharmacy. I'm also, I was also a medic in the military for uh, a few years. Um, so I do enjoy um, that role as a veteran and helping the veteran, uh, the, the patients that, that come in, their veterans and helping them out um, with their uh, medication history, because that's primarily what I do now. Um, as far as aspiration uh, for this meeting, I'm looking forward to talking about how technology, um, the use of technology can improve patient safety in our practice. Um, also, the, the roles for technicians and how we can look at that and, and look to see how we can um, expand that role to um, help the workload stress that is currently happening now in, in pharmacies, especially community pharmacies. Um, so I'm looking forward to discussing those specifically those two topics, technology and technicians. Um, personal fact about me, um, let's see. Um, I once uh, won a chicken wing eating contest. <laughs> Tom's. <laughs> My name is Priyal Patel. Uh, I'm a board member and for more than over a year. I joined about a year ago. Yeah, that's fact. October, that's right. Uh, my brief background, so I was pharmacist in India when I was 21 years old, and I came to USA and start all over my doctor of pharmacy, got my doctorate degree. Uh, and I started my first job was as a technician, and then um, I got my doctorate degree, then I become a pharmacy manager, you know, take on the big role for two mid to high volume pharmacy. Then I opened up 340B Pharmacy, worked for the LifeWorks uh, uh, Pharmacy. Uh, there's a pharmacy in the LifeWorks, so I helped the behavioral health care patient there. Then um, I start the new transition of care program for the one of the acute care hospital. I done that. Um, then I also start the new clinical pharmacy program for the North Bend Medical Center is the one of the 
um, big primary healthcare clinic in the coastal area, uh, Southern Oregon. Um, then I'm also work as a clinical pharmacist still in that hospital. I'm also part of the PND committee for the local CCO. Uh, and I'm a co-owner of the independent pharmacy. <laughs> so that's my brief, brief background. Uh, for this meeting, uh, my goal will be how can we lessen the administrative burden so our licensee can do their job what, or what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> it's too much administrative burden. Uh, one personal fact about me is I want to be a pharmacist when I was six years old. <laughs> And I did not do any other job. I started as a technician. I'm still in the pharmacy, so. Hello, I'm board member Shannon Beeman. This is my sixth year on the board. Uh, I'm currently part-time at a compounding pharmacy and my career background has been predominantly in retail and compounding. Um, objective for the meeting is to I have so many um, to try to realign with with where the board's at overall and see how we can try to um, help the state that pharmacies are in and thus patients are in um, and and uh, get a sense of of, of of where everybody's at with that. <laughs> And a personal fact about me, I am chronically covered in white hair from my two and a half year old husky. He uh, has infected my primary car. And um and uh but we enjoy lots of walks every every day we can and uh she is just a ball of sunshine. So. Uh my name is um board member Cindy Vipperman. Um, I'm a pharmacy technician on the board. I was the first pharmacy technician, one of the two first pharmacy technicians to be on the board. Um, I started my career in pharmacy November 7th, so yesterday in 1997. So 26 years, I'm on 26 years. Um, I spent 21 years at Fred Meyer Pharmacy in the Dallas, Oregon. Um, the last four years have been at uh, St. Charles in Bend. Um, I love the different aspects of each of those positions and um, looking forward to uh, moving moving the medication history um, unit forward in that. Uh, my objective for this meeting. So my object, um, objective for the Board of Pharmacy has always been and always will continue to be um, for the safety of uh, the patients and the public of Oregon. Um, however, we can move that forward. Um, that's that's the the um, that's the path I want to follow. I think for the last um, well, let's see, the last four years since we um, had um, you know the strategic planning, I think it has been awesome. I think we have went through so many things that we wanted to check off, and we checked them off. I think we're doing a great job, and I think that we can continue to do a great job moving forward. Um, but my objective will always be the patient safety um, aspect. So a personal fact about me is um, I am not boring ever. Um, I volunteer a lot. Um, <laughs> last, two, last week I um, volunteered for a sock hop <laughs> in the Dells. And then the next day I was the MC for a uh, cancer patient luncheon. So I volunteer a lot and I love that. I love giving back to my community. I love giving back to my state. I'd love to give back to anything I can. So um, that's that's my little fact about me. <laughs> Hi, I, uh, I am staff member Naomi Graham. I am the office manager for the Board of Pharmacy and I started in June, 2022. I started my career in Australia as a legal secretary and a junior paralegal. And when I moved to the US, I um, became an office manager, project manager at a graphic design firm. And then from there, I moved on to be the uh, DMCA anti-piracy um, compliance manager at a company that worked with very large movie studios and television studios. 
Um, my objectives for this meeting, I think, is a clear directive for staff to help us know how to uh, serve the mission of the agency. And um, a personal fact about me is almost every weekend I go hiking and I do macro photography with my uh, cell phone of mushrooms and lichen and wasps because when you're zooming on them, it's really like this whole entire new ecosystem. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm staff member Hennigan. I am currently the licensing manager of the board. This is, I've been with the board 20 years and this is my third role. I started as a licensing representative. I was then the office manager for six years, 10 years, I'm sorry, 10 years. And then um, I became the licensing manager in 2016. Um, my objective is to understand the board's directives and figure out how we can operationalize the goals. Um, and a personal fact about me, this summer I had the opportunity to spend um, about 5,000 miles on the back of a motorcycle. Um, my husband's a member of the International Association of Firefighters Motorcycle Group, the Oregon chapter, and I'm very much looking forward to becoming an associate member so I can put a patch on the back of my jacket and look as cool as they do. Great. Hi, I'm facilitator Brittany Sale with Pivotal Resources. I'm an organizational improvement consultant, and I've been with Pivotal for several years. I have an educational and academic background in industrial organizational psychology, and then I worked in nonprofit development and continuous improvement and program evaluation. I'm looking forward to helping facilitate and support your work today. And fun fact is I've been injured for a little while, but once upon a time, I was a pretty good salsa dancer. Hello, I'm facilitator Vashti Boyce. I use they and she pronouns. Um, I run Wild Iris Consulting, but I work with Pivotal Resources. Um, my background, uh, my background is in um, community-based behavioral health. Um, and my objective and aspiration for this meeting is to support you all in expanding thinking and responsibility and connection to kind of the DEI portion of the work that you all do. Um, to integrate that into um, every facet of what the work does. Um, and one personal fact about me, I am absolutely obsessed with stationery, specifically like Japanese planners and pens and all sorts of things. So. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Karen McLean, Administrative Director for the Board. I am finishing my 22nd year with the Board next month. Um, with the agency and a brief career background. I worked for over 15 years as a law librarian in a private law firm. And obviously the last 20 some odd years I've been with the state. I worked for the Department of Justice for a short stint before I came to the Board of Pharmacy. Um, my objective and aspiration for this meeting is to continue to learn and grow, especially in regards to DEI and how the board can incorporate that better in our agency as well as in our board and policies. Um, so I'm super excited that Vashti is here. And one personal fact about me, I just returned from Hawaii and I had the amazing opportunity to see 67 sea turtles wow. land on the beach. I didn't watch each one land on the beach, but they were, I have many pictures if anybody wants to see them, but they were super cool. Joanna Tucker Davis. I've been a lawyer for 25 years, and the last 16 of those have been with the Oregon Department of Justice, where I give advice to agencies and boards like you. Um, my objective is just to take in what you all are saying so that I can hopefully help me provide you the best legal advice over the coming time. Um, I'm the mom of two teenage boys, which means for someone who doesn't play video games, I know way more than I do. <laughs> I'm Joe Schnabel. My current position is advisor to Executive Director Fox. <laughs> a brief career background includes a little over 42 years ago, I started pharmacy school at Oregon State. Uh, proceeded on to Indiana to do a RMD program at Purdue University and a residency at Indiana University Hospitals. Came back to Oregon and started a position at Salem Health, where I was for about 31 years when I retired in 2019 and then took the board executive director position. I was a board member from 1993 to 2001, served as board president three times during that uh, 
two um, terms on the board. My objective for this meeting is to help set the groundwork for another successful strategic planning meeting and service historian, perhaps. <laughs> and a personal fact about me is. Fortunately, I'm relearning the art and craft of photography that helped get me through college as I was dabbling in a journalism career. And I have a senior uh, who wanted her picture taken, so I've had to learn how to use this very complex camera that I've never really learned how to use. So it's, it's coming along. <laughs> Hi, um, good morning. I'm Rosemary Hemmins. Um, currently, I CEO, owner of a mental health group practice um, in Beaverton. Um, in addition to that, I'm assistant professor at OHSU School of Dentistry, where I created and actually teach the first social terms of health, health equity, and social justice course to dental students. I've had the opportunity to travel um, to other dental schools um, to present my work. Um, including China, Shanghai, China. Um, I would refer to myself as a public health psychotherapist. My PhD is in public health. My master's is in social work. Um, my objectives today is I'm just here to observe and I'm curious to see um, what goals have been achieved um, from the last time we had this meeting, which was my first one um, a year ago. Um, one personal fact about me, I love the ocean. So being here um, is really great for my mental health and peace of mind. Uh, I find it very relaxing. I could just stare at it all day. So I'm glad I have this. <laughs> um, and that's it. I'm Joe Ball. My position, I've been compliance officer with the board for 21 years. As far as objective for this meeting, I'm hoping to learn from the board the direction the board is going and hopefully apply that to my position. And a personal fact, I will be testing for my black belt in karate in about a month. Oh, so, yeah. Good. Hi, I'm um, board member Jennifer Hall. Um, I was a pharmacy technician before I became a pharmacist. I started out in the hospital setting in food and nutrition back in 98 and um, was a tech and an intern for about four years at a hospital in Portland and then um, became a pharmacist. I went to Pacific University. I was the first graduating class there. Um, and then um, I've been working at the current hospital, Emanuel, Lake Sea Emanuel in Portland, Oregon, for 14 years, um, mainly um, in the inpatient, uh, in the basement. I'm, you know, checking IVs and I'm kind of the lead pharmacist down there, but I also have worked some of the floors. Um, and let's see. I think a goal for this meeting, this is my second meeting, so I'm new to the board. Um, I would like to find clever ways to help lessen the workload and stress on pharmacists and technicians um, and increase healthcare access for all Oregonians. Um, so I'm excited to see what we can accomplish in this meeting. And then um, one fact about me, um, I have two kids. Um, my daughter is 14. She's really into um, girls basketball. So we're a big follower of girls basketball. And then I have an eight year old son whose birthday is next month. Staff member Jennifer Davis, my current position is pharmacist consultant with the board. I've been with the board for three going on four years. I started as an investigator for a very short time. Um, and then my background is all community pharmacy, similar to one of our other board members. I started as a pharmacy clerk. I've held no other jobs outside of pharmacy and I've worked my way and been a tech and an intern and a pharmacist and manager, a clinical coordinator. I'll always work in pharmacy, love, love the career and work field. Um, my aspiration or goal for this meeting is really just to listen and hear what the board's direction is and then to work on how we operationalize that as staff um, to help support you. 
And one personal fact about me is last year, I think, um, I visited my 50th state. I've been to all 50 states. I have a bit of wanderlust in my soul. And so I love to travel. So traveling and being here at this meeting, I'm, it's gorgeous. So yes. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. I'm Kat Chen. I am a board member. I'll be two years as a board member in January, but I was on the original um we call it the PFAC, the, the, the um, Formula Advisory Committee. I was the um, APRN role on that for years, and that's how I got involved with the Board of Pharmacy. And then um, when my term on another board was up, I applied for the public position on this board and was fortunately fortunate enough to um, be awarded this position, and I love it. Um, my job is a nurse practitioner. I started out in the medical field as a mom needing a job and a pediatrician hiring me to be a medical office assistant. Um, I went through, <laughs> started school, um, went to school to be a pediatric nurse practitioner and finished that degree um, with the fellowship at CDRC in 2000. Couldn't get a job in pediatrics because it was just not a um, place that Nurse, well, nurse practitioners weren't what they were now um, that many years ago. So I went back to school um, to get an FNP and met people in geriatrics and loved it so much that I got hired when I graduated. And I've been a um, primary care provider for 22 years and am looking at maybe retiring in two years. It'll be it'll be. 25 years with um, Peace Health at that time, but I'm one of the weird people who got hired and stayed in one place. So, and I love it. I truly, truly love my job. And objective for this meeting, um, I was fortunate enough to go to the um, regional meeting, and it was interesting to hear other perspectives of pharmacy from other states. And I'm looking forward to hearing ideas, how we can safely move pharmacy from just being, you know, tasked and really expanding how we can do the work of pharmacy, expand the access to all Oregonians, but in a manner that we can still do it in a safe place and not harm Oregonians. So there's a juxtaposition that I, I'm looking forward to the people in the industry helping me understand. Um, personal fact, Cindy, I volunteer most of my free time if I'm not with family. Um, I am a passionate cook. I cook for anywhere from 10 to 200 people, and that's what I do for my volunteer work. I um, do the Heartfelt House, which is the Ronald McDonald House. I do the Lions Club, and I do... Um, events that my son-in-law does for his business. So I'd love to cook for people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Executive Director Fox, um, I'm not going to go. I think my uh, background has been shared over and over in the last couple of weeks. So I'm not going to address that, but I'll, I'll tell you some interesting facts about myself and then I'll get into the uh, aspiration of this meeting. Uh, so what what you cannot read about me through Google, uh, <laughs> I do love to, uh, like board member Vipperman, I'm a, a serial community volunteer um, anywhere I go in the community. Um, similar to um, is it Brittany, Brittany, yeah. Brittany. Um, I took ballroom dancing uh, back in the day. And I did ballroom dancing when it got stressful in the Walgreens pharmacy when I was in <laughs> um, I also, during the same time, um, similar to uh, staff member Paul, I took karate, uh, Jeet Kune Do, um, for many years of my time. I have um, went to seminary school and I uh, had, at a young age, in middle school, I had my own entertainment label because uh, I come from a music background, music family. Um, for me, today is about listening, learning, understanding how to support the board and, and lead the staff into the next iteration of the Board of Pharmacy for Oregon, um, understanding that we're at an inflection point 
and how do we operationalize equity through everything that we do, how we talk about it, the lenses that we use when we show up in certain spaces. Um, also, how do we strengthen our communication internally and externally with all stakeholders? How do we talk about and enhance innovation? Um, and what does that look like? What does that mean to patient care, regulatory and compliance uh, and all we do? So uh, how, as Jim Collins, as I wrap up, Jim Collins was saying how to go from good to great is what I'm looking at and hopefully to take away from this meeting. Very good. And I'm last, I'm Pete Pandy, facilitator, consultant with Pivotal Resources. Um, I've been doing organization change, problem solving, decision making for, well, I'll say Pivotal Resources is 30 years old as of June, and I was at the company when it started. Before then, I was probably only five years old. <laughs> we just that for a long time. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with the Board of Pharmacy since 2019. So hard to believe this will be the fifth one of these meetings that I've helped facilitate. So um, really rewarding to be able to work with an organization for an extended period of time. It's one of the things I like about our job is we get to help help organizations a lot. Um, and my objective is to help, well, well, my aspiration is that each of you leaving this meeting on Thursday, tomorrow afternoon, feels like it was a very productive, useful, and successful event. Um, even though you might feel there were some tense moments at times or different points of view were shared because that's part of the process of achieving good work in an organization. There's, you know, if everybody comes in with the same idea, we could probably leave right now, right? Um, so we're gonna have to, to have some some sharing and discussion and different ideas. So um, helping you work through that and uh, feel positive about it at the end, that's my aspiration. Um, I've been thinking a lot about personal facts. This is sort of a professional and not just personal fact, but I was fortunate enough to co-author a book that came out in 2000 on the topic of Six Sigma. Some of you may have heard of that. And it was sort of the first publisher issued book about that topic, which at the time was just this big business fad. So I kind of got in on the ground floor and the book was quite successful. It sold probably 250, 300,000 copies, which in a business book is kind of a big deal. And it got translated into about 20 languages. Now we're moving our office. My wife and I are sort of downsizing and I've got like multiple copies of this book. <laughs> and I'm going, what am I going to do with all, you know, Turkish versions of the Six Sigma way? So if anybody is interested in a book about organization improvement, whatever language you can think of, come to me. I, I'll give it to you. That's it. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for that. And um, I think one, one important thing to remember, everybody arrives at a meeting like this with, you know, I wouldn't call it baggage. It's really value and and um things that you have learned and developed in your lives that are very important so all the opinions that i know you're all going to share um you have your background other people have theirs and um i think it's always important we talk about this later in, a, in any kind of activity like this is to assume good intent on the part of others one of the things we tell a lot of people you know leaders in organizations you know they get different silos and camps and um you know it's sort of like i don't trust you because you must have a point of view, but most people are there to help their organization, in this case, pharmacy be successful. So kind of a ground rule. So um, one of the things I wanted to, um, this is still facilitator Pandy talking, um, just remind you what kind of the, the big picture of the work we're doing here is. Um, so today and tomorrow, we're gonna to be going through an in-depth exchange of ideas about what are the opportunities and challenges for the Board of Pharmacy for Pharmacy in Oregon? And that'll then involve some discussion. At the end, it will be the board's message to the, the staff, you know, here's where we'd like you to go. Um, hopefully it'll be all aligned. There may be different points of view, um, but that's kind of the, the cussing and discussing that we're gonna do. I had a colleague from Texas and she used to say that all the time, which I love. Um, because it's sort of how you say it, it's cussing and discussing. <laughs> um, 
So, so that's what we're going to do here. Um, but then the next step will be for the board staff, Jamal in his first iteration doing this, to take your input as for the board and then synthesize that into a plan. All right. So we're not expecting to come up with the plan here. We're expecting you to the board to provide direction, the staff then to interpret that and feedback to you. Okay, here are the specific goals, actions that we hope to accomplish. And then you have the chance as board members to say, now you got it wrong there, or you know, how about this? So it's an iterative process to come up with the plan that hopefully, you know, won't be a huge amount of back and forth. But that's that's the goal. So this is not the the objective of today's and tomorrow's, not the plan, it's the direction to create the plan. Just want to make sure everybody's comfortable with that. Questions on that? It makes sense. Yes. Board Member Hemmins, um, at what point do we look at the strategic plan that we created the last time? Or is, is that going to be part of this where we look at what the plan was and where we are before we move on to figuring out what our plan moving forward will be? Um, so I think the next item on our agenda actually is for um, staff member Schnabel to provide a feedback on a kind of review of what the previous goals were and then what the progress has been made. Um, so that will be kind of our update from the strategic plan. Later on, when we get into talking about specific areas of focus, we'll share just the high level goals that were defined at the actually the existing plan, right? Because we haven't revised it yet. So, and at any time, you know, we can talk about what have we accomplished, what have we not accomplished. So is that yeah. kind of what your concern is or what your question is? Um somewhat. I will reserve my additional questions for later. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I think facilitator Pandy be not easy to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we have an agenda that allows discussion, allows questions. So I think that's one of the important things. If anything that comes up that you think, well, we haven't asked or answered this question that I have, you should speak up. This is meant to be, you know, a discussion oriented activity. So, um, so board member Hemings, if you don't, that question doesn't come up clear enough to you, then please, you know, raise it again. Board member Hemings, I sure will. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Other questions, comments? All right. Well, that's um, oh, so we just last year, last year's meeting, we did this and it seemed like it'd be good again, just to kind of remind everybody what is the role of a board member? Um, you've all seen and um, have, I hope are aware of the, the board handbook that's provided from the governor's office. And we um, distributed kind of a summary of that, um, but just some of the key points or, you know, what does it mean to be a board member or a commission member, or whatever you know, the name of the body is in Oregon? Um, that all members are really there to, to represent the public. So you all have your specific jobs and functions and organizations you work for, which is not, you know, you can't check that at the door. But really, when you walk into a room like this, your job is to represent the public. Um, so that means not really here to represent your association or your employer or what have you. Um, it's very important, and this will be kind of the ground rule for the meeting today, is to, to listen to everybody's viewpoint, to try to work and develop cohesion as a group, recognizing that doesn't mean you always agree on everything, um, and be open to different ideas. And so how we communicate, not interrupting, those kinds of things help ensure that um, our public members are really important. Um, and because you are not, you know, as in depth knowledgeable of the practice of pharmacy as others who are pharmacists or technicians, you know, it's expected that you may have questions about it. So, you know, help me understand this a little bit because, you know, I don't stand behind the counter. I don't, you know, do drug formulation and so forth. Um, and really important, I think, to me, most of what I do in helping organizations is to try to 
help them kind of apply common sense more consistently. Um, I may have mentioned this before, but I've learned that common sense tends to be the least common of the senses. So that's why I've been doing this for years plus. Um, so we'll try to, uh, you know, recognize that even though there's a lot of, you know, detail in the rules, sort of putting a common sense lens on that can be helpful um, as we go. So just a few reminders about the board role and things to help this be a um, more successful meeting in, in your roles. Effective. Questions, comments? Anything they want to emphasize on this? Anybody? Okay. Hopefully that's helpful. All right. So I'm now going to turn it over to staff, former executive, outgoing executive director Schnabel. I think that's better than just staff. <laughs> like Ian said, that. <laughs> Thank you. This is staff member Schnabel. <laughs> <laughs> the current 2022 to 2026 strategic plan was the result of the strategic planning meeting that was held in November of 2021. Board staff, along with current board members, Beeman, DeBarmore, Doyle, Joyce, and Vipperman were present, along with former board members, Ayub and Murray. No public members were on the board at that time. The meeting was held virtually via Teams as necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll remember that fun. 2021 strategic planning meeting was held to review and replace the 2020 to 2024 strategic plan that resulted from the initial 2019 strategic planning meeting. As a reminder, the current strategic planning process results in a four-year strategic plan every two years. Overlapping four-year plans, allows for focus on priority activities plus enough room in the future to continue working on important initiatives that may be or may not be accomplished in the early years of the plan, and then they can be rolled over into the next plan. In odd-numbered years like this one, the board conducts a comprehensive review and revision of the four-year plan, and in even-numbered years, the board reviews the current four-year plan and makes any course corrections it feels are necessary. That's what happened last year. Going forward, the board and executive director Fox may continue the current process or make any changes that they feel are warranted. During the proceedings for the current strategic plan in November 2021, we were in the middle of the COVID pandemic, emerging from the Delta wave and heading toward the Omicron wave that resulted in the highest case rates, hospitalization rates, and death rates of the pandemic so far. Still going, remember. Pharmacies were closing without public notice due to staff shortages, and the board office was receiving increasing complaints from the public who were unable to access their medications. This environment impacted the strategic planning process and the outcomes of the plan. The pestle exercise resulted in expressions of concern in the cases of pharmacy staffing, safe practice conditions, lack of pharmacist control over their practice, and the great resignation of pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. Within that environment, the board adopted a new strategic plan intended to address some or all of these issues and to continue to revise and modernize pharmacy rules as outlined in the previous plan. Rachel, did you happen to have that slide with the rules? Um, it's okay if you don't. I think, I think the board understands that we have increased our rulemaking activities over the years. And, um, the process of undertaking a procedural rule review along with responding to the pandemic has resulted in an unusual high volume of rulemaking. It's probably 10 times the normal baseline rate of rulemaking that the board had done. Uh, it's dramatic to look at it on a chart. Anyway, despite the high volume of rulemaking, there's been much needed and vigorous discussion and debate around issues central to the practice of pharmacy. These board discussions have resulted in rules with better clarity and organization than the ones that they've replaced. Frontline pharmacists and technicians will find very little difference in the way they practice under the new rules. And in addition, pharmacists have more authority over their practice environment and their ability to deploy technicians and technology to assist in their practice. Current plan, the 2022 to 26 strategic plan contains five major goal areas, technicians, technology, licensing and registration, regulation and communication um, that were held over primarily from the 2020 to 2024 plan. So I'll now review each of the defined goal areas and then the progress of each key action. 
technicians, the goal was to articulate the regulatory structure where the accountabilities of pharmacists and the role of pharmacy technicians are aligned to enhance safety, access, and service, service and efficiency. The board seeks to develop clear rules to ensure that pharmacists understand their legal scope of practice and their ability to provide patient care services and safe pharmacy practices. Rules permitting pharmacists to more fully and effectively utilize technician support must be structured to improve safety, access, and patient care services. The board seeks rule alignment to clearly describe the role of pharmacy technicians and how they assist the pharmacist in the practice of pharmacy. Regulatory structures developed for technician roles should delineate requirements for training, quality assurance, and pharmacist supervision. Under the technology goal, uh, the goal is to articulate the regulatory structure where the accountabilities of pharmacists and the use of technology are aligned to enhance safety, access, service, and efficiency. The board seeks to develop clear rules to ensure that pharmacists understand their scope of practice and their accountability to provide patient care services and safe pharmacy practices while permitting the use of technologies that improve safety, access, service, and efficiency. Regulatory structures developed for the use of technology should be function-based and delineate pharmacist and drug outlet accountabilities for each critical stage of automated processes. Under licensing and registration, the goal is to clarify licensing and registration categories to promote appropriate professional licensure and drug outlet registration. Board promotes patient safety through appropriate licensing and registration of all licensees and drug outlets engaged in the practice of pharmacy or assistance in the practice of pharmacy and in the manufacture, dispensing, delivery, or distribution of drugs, devices, and supplies. License and registration categories should clearly guide applicants to the appropriate license type. Under the regulation bucket, the goal is to systematically refresh rules and standardize rule development to improve clarity, compliance, and longevity. The board proactively reviews and updates rules to provide clear and ex clear expectations to licensees and registrants to promote compliance and patient safety. Rule updates should emphasize clarity, compliance, and longevity that allows practice variation and that improves safety, access, service, and efficiency. And finally, communication. The goal is to improve and maintain stakeholder and public engagement through proactive communication strategies. The board communicates through multiple platforms to collaborate, educate, promote patient safety, and enhance consumer protection. So the key actions under each of those uh, goals was under technicians. The first one was to revise rules to make pharmacy technician licensure renewable indefinitely and remove the five-year waiting period for reapplication of lapsed pharmacy technician licenses. Uh, we uh, adopted divisions 21, 25, and 110 related to pharmacy technicians and certified pharmacy technicians in uh, February of 2022. It was a temporary rule. Then we permanently adopted rules in April of 2022 that were effective that month. Uh, we added similar language in adopted rules in August of 2023 that will be effective in March of 2024 in Division 125, the complete uh, pharmacy technician chapter. And number two was to review, review technician licensing and training rules to remove barriers to licensure for those wishing to become licensed and to renew their license. Division 125, again, related to pharmacy technicians, will be adopted or will be effective on March 1 of 24. Uh, the third key action was to evaluate the impact of a single renewable pharmacy technician license. The impact of that was that licensees uh, in the pharmacy technician category in November of 2021, there were 1,450. Uh, this year, two years later, there are 2,379, so almost 1,000 more pharmacy technicians. Uh, as a result of making the pharmacy technician license renewable. Uh, the action number four, evaluate the role of national certification as a requirement for licensure and assess those functions in the assistance of the practice of pharmacy for which national certification would enhance public health and safety. Uh, there's not That has not been completed and there's still work to be done on that one. Number, key action number five, the last one, review and assess applicable statutes for the development of rules that clearly articulate the responsibilities of a pharmacist and functions that only a pharmacist may perform. And those rules were adopted in August of 23 for pharmacists, the new Division 115, and the new Division 125 related to pharmacy technicians. 
Under the technology goal, the first key action is to implement remote dispensing site pharmacy rules and amend them as more is learned from experiences of pharmacists, certified Oregon pharmacy technicians, pharmacy te technicians, and the public about their effectiveness at maintaining public health and safety while improving access to pharmacy services. Those rules were adopted in June of 2022 in Division 139. Second key action is to draft and adopt rules for pharmacy prescription lockers or PPLs and amend the PPL rules as more is learned from experiences of pharmacists, technicians, and the public about their effectiveness at maintaining public health and safety while improving access to medications and supplies. Those rules were adopted in June of 2022. And three was to draft and adopt rules for kiosks and amend the kiosk rules as more is learned from experiences of pharmacists, techs, the public about their effectiveness at maintaining public health and safety while improving access to medications and supplies. And those rules were adopted in December 2022. So all of those uh, technologies have been adopted in rule. And the fourth key action was to amend the RDSP rule, or I'm sorry, amend the remote dispensing machine and remote distribution facility rules to align with the RDSP and PPL rules. I believe that um, those rules are in in the process of being revised. And so the board has not seen them yet, but they are definitely being worked on. Under licensing and registration, the first key action was to review technician licensing and training rules, to remove barriers to licensure for those wishing to become licensed and renew their license. Again, we talked about that. Renew, uh, the rules were adopted in August and will be effective on uh, March 1st of 2024. We've updated application questions for licensees and adopted rules for clarity, applicability, qualifications, and required documentation for pharmacy technicians. Second key action was to create and implement a consistent ongoing process to evaluate applicable statutes for each drug outlet registration type and develop rules that clearly outline the appropriate registration type for each outlet. And that is part of the division vision and that is <coughs> ongoing to separate Division 41 into specific drug outlet types rather than have them all co-mingled within a single uh, chapter. The third key, key action was uh, to evaluate the legislative and budgetary considerations that may be required to implement changes to drug outlet registration types, and uh, that has not been completed. That's still work to be done. And regulation, key action number one, identify a complete process uh, for submitting legislative concept or board to compel licensees to undergo substance use disorder evaluations or compliance cases involving substance use. That was House Bill 20, 2291, uh, but it did not pass. It did not get a, a location in a hearing, so uh, they were too busy. It was, a, it was more of a bandwidth issue than uh, the merits of the bill. Key action number two, update continuing pharmacy education rules to create clear expectations that guide licensees and professional development that improves their ability to safely engage in contemporary pharmacy practice. Those rules were adopted in December of 2022 and became effective this past July. Key action number three is to evaluate the current state of pharmacy practice in Oregon and convene a safe pharmacy practice conditions work group to develop rules to assure that uh, to assure that clearly outline requirements for safe pharmacy practice in all pharmacy settings. Uh, rules were adopted in February of 2023 in Divisions 19 and 41 related to safe practice conditions. Uh, rules also were adopted in April of 2022 in Divisions 41 and 139 related to accurate pharmacy hours and temporary pharmacy closures. Okay. The action number four was to create standard procedures to schedule and schedule to accomplish the five-year rule review that emphasizes clarity and durability of the rules. And that is part of the division vision. Uh, the action five, conduct routine scheduled and systematic review of Board of Pharmacy rules by division and draft revisions for board consideration. Again, that's division vision ongoing. The action six, develop rules to ensure consistency with the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. Uh, again, that's division vision and we had an um, a bill passed to align our definitions of uh, drug wholesaler and add the definition of a third party logistics provider that was passed this last legislative session. 
And key action number seven was to amend rules for drug compounding to ensure consistency with updated USP chapter 795 and 797. Those are in progress. The board will conduct its first review in December of 23 uh, at the board meeting next month. Uh, work groups were held in January of 23 through August of 2023. And uh, rules were noticed in July of 2023 for public comment only. And we received lots of public comment. And lastly, in the communications area, first key action, execute the agency's communication plan at all levels to improve access to relevant information and encourage stakeholder engage engagement. We deployed the gov delivery uh, system to communicate with our licensees and registrants and anybody who was interested in pharmacy communications. In, in January of 2022, we had 18,764 18, subscribers. By November of 2022, not even a year later, we had 26,104 subscribers, an increase of 7,340 in 11 months. And at the end of October this year, we were up to 27,310 total subscribers in our gut delivery system. We implemented multiple racks and work groups, the first one continuing ph pharmacy education. First started in January of 22, Safe Pharmacy Practice Conditions work or RAC started in January of 2022 and continued through July of 22. The intern RAC met again uh, January of 23 through May of 23. The compounding RAC started in February of 23 through July of 23. And the Collaborative Drug Therapy Management and Clinical Pharmacy Agreement RAC met in May of 2023. The second key action is to utilize the public records request process to respond to inquiries for agency records and provide training to agency staff responding compliance with state law. We created standard work to standardize the process and to meet the statutory timelines. And then the third key action is to continue regular outreach to stakeholder groups, including schools and colleges of pharmacy, pharmacy associations, and the public. We completed uh, in the last year, 10 offerings of the PIC training class in 2023 and 10 in 2022. Uh, the OHA pharmacy partners meetings, we presented four board reports in 2023 and four in 2022. Uh, we presented to the College and School of Pharmacy in Oregon, three to Oregon State and two to Pacific in 2023, and three to Oregon State and one to Pacific in 2022. Uh, for the pharmacy associations, we had uh, vendor booths at uh, OSHP and OSPA did a presentation for the OSHP and OSPA meetings in 2023, and we had booths in 2022 and also presented in 2022 to the OSHP. Coalition, Pharmacy Coalition, which consists of um, multiple stakeholders, uh, we provide about eight reports to the coalition group every year. Uh, the fourth key action was to utilize analytics from the agency's website and listserv to perform and improve agency communications. That has not been, been done holistically, but it's done when needed. We have, when we have a question about uh, specific uh, items on the website. And then the last key action is for staff to explore methods to provide useful legal information to licensees and registrants to facilitate compliance with statutes and rules. And that's an ongoing uh, process for the uh, phone duty compliance officer. And they're working on improving uh, statements and ability to respond to requests from the field. That's my report. I was able to. And there's it. what we've done in terms of rules. It, <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. Explain that. We're a little busier than we used to be. This, this is board member um, Chin. Part of that is a lot of emergency rules that happened because of COVID. This is something that was happening on, I think, a lot of health care because of the emergency rule. I think also, if I'm not mistaken, it was part of the strategic plan before this to um, really look at rule updates um, that hadn't been looked at for a long time. So it does look ridiculous, but there's a lot of, I think, explanation that I I think I understand of why it looks ridiculous. <laughs> This is board member Beeman, but as a, a comment to you, to board member Chen's comments, I think too, we've heard from stakeholders and a, a lot of um, comments about how the 
bulk of rules going out for 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 comment for rulemaking is hard to keep up with. And I think too, especially from attending virtually for one of our meeting days in October, board members didn't remember reviewing some of the rules. The conversation we were having felt very circular. And um, I think that it's something, and we might talk about this later, but I just want to make sure it's set out there. Like we need to address this because if we aren't extremely clear and extremely confident on what we're putting forward for rules, that's not fair to our licensees and that's not fair to the public. Even if safety is our our motive with this, is it actual safety or is it only in the name of safety? And let's get these rules passed through. And so that's kind of my growing concern with the bulk and I appreciate all the work that goes into it by staff. And I'm not trying to minimize that, but I think that we need to reevaluate how quickly we're moving through and the bulk at which we're moving through. Cause I think it's not fair to licensees because they can't keep up with the rules if, and thus can't keep patients safe if that is our intent. So is our, if our intent is always safety, but at, is it, in, is it real or is it, we just perceive it because we're getting the move through. Other comments or questions, uh, Facilitator Pandy, other comments or questions for staff member Schnabel and his report? Board member Hemmings, did that provide some of the overview you were looking for in terms of accomplishments relative to the previous plan? Uh, board member Hemmings, yes, it did. Um, I, I may have um, forgotten. Um, but I thought that there was something about um, equity that was discussed um, last year, but I didn't hear, you know, I could see equity issues throughout all of these pillars, but um, I'm, I'm not sure if Maybe I'm mistaken that we didn't include equity specifically, call it out specifically last year. And that's why I didn't hear it today. Um, but I would hope that we would do so moving forward. Facilitator Pandy, um, I would just say my recollection is that the diversity, equity, inclusion was not an explicit. Okay. Mentioned in the previous plan, but it is absolutely part of the agenda for this week's session. So that's, I think the answer to your question is it wasn't, but it will be just as you were hoping. Okay. Yes, Board Member Patel. Board Member Patel, I think in your report, I think you mentioned that we formed the RAC. I don't think we formed the RAC, we formed the work group. Correct. So it was not the rest. Oh. Rack is different. Okay. Other comments? All right. So we're actually a little bit ahead on our agenda. So um, we we're going to take a break after um, Mr. Schnabel's report, but I think we'll go ahead and cover this next section. If you're okay with that, be all right with that. Um, and we'll take a break a little bit after more like when we had it. Okay, um, so hopefully then this will, um, and I'm, I'll stand up for this. Beth, she's gonna be joining me as well. Um, so part of the process that we've gone through for this strategic planning cycle, um, because this is the, the two day more in depth look and we have changing the board, we have new executive director, a lot of things that have been kind of becoming growing issues for the agency. So this year we did a more intensive, the pivotal resources did a more intensive outreach as part of the strategic planning process. So we spoke to all the board members, we spoke to a number of staff, all the management team, as well as external stakeholders from the two universities and the two associations. So we got a much broader kind of set of inputs in part of this process. So what I'm going to share now, and then that she's going to help talk about the DEI portion of what we did. And I think this will resonate with some of the things that you were just mentioning. Um, 
So this is our evaluation or assessment, outreach and assessment. The outreach um, part of it is to you know, engage people in this process. So you don't just walk into here with a, you know, not having even pre-thought about what some of the issues and opportunities are. We want to give people a chance to, you know, kind of get their minds ready for this process um, to talk about, you know, how have the pre previous strategic planning activities gone? What have been some of the pros and cons? Um, to get, get you thinking about different ideas for opportunities and to support change management, because anytime you're going to do things differently, it means people need to get used to doing things differently. Um, so what we did, as I mentioned, in these individual interviews, we also looked at the um, key performance measures for the agency, demographics on licensees, looked at the affirmative action plan. So, you know, we've been generating and, and looking at a lot of different information. And so what we're going to do now is present pretty much a high level view of what we've found. So I tried to avoid, you know, getting into lots of nits and nats and boring you with a lot of detail. Um, so just some reminders about this. When we do an assessment, it's always a little bit like, can't you tell us some good stuff? So we're going to tell you some good stuff. But the but, you know, because we're looking at what we want to do to improve going forward, you know, the emphasis will tend to be on, you know, here's where we could do some improvement. And even when we talk about the good stuff, it's usually we're making progress, but, you know, so we're not going to give you all the buts, but you'll probably know what some of those are. Um, whenever we present this, you got to really prioritize. So that's why we're doing strategic planning. One of the things that I think has been good about Board of Pharmacy's plans, um, unlike maybe some other agencies where they have these huge laundry lists of all these things you're going to do, and it's sort of, you know, not, nothing stands out. It's just, you know, oh, we're really busy, right? Well, it's good to be busy, but you, if you're going to get something done, you have to focus on certain priorities. Um, so, you know, part of adapting the plan and direction for the Board of Pharmacy, as in any organization, is you've got sort of four options gener generally. One is keep doing what we're doing. Another one is maybe we need to back off or back down or slow down a little bit because maybe we're getting ahead of our ski or over our skis. Um, there may be new stuff we need to do because we have a gap that nobody's really working on or we're not working on now or do nothing. OK, so as we go forward, you know, re realigning the strategic plan will be about, you know, kind of a mix of those types of, of options. And then to as much as possible to find clear direction and goals before action. One of the things that, you know, in terms of timing of a strategic plan, um, for example, there is oftentimes a desire to do, you know, more community outreach, right? But you could do community outreach leading up to the plan, or you can say, well, you know, we want to do like kind of like what we did a little bit. And then one of the objectives following the plan is to do more community outreach, right? So, you know, the timing of when you sort of set the plan and when you actually do tasks can vary depending on what your bandwidth is, what the right sequence of activities might be. Um, so there might be, this is sort of a message to the board, a priority or a direction to the staff to investigate this further, not necessarily go do this. In other words, you know, don't fix rules by blah, blah, blah. Take a closer look at how we're doing in the rules so we can come back and think about what the options would be to make it better. Right. So it's not coming out with a, you know, give us a solution. The the objective might be dig deeper into this so we better understand what's going on. Does that make sense? Um, because you don't want to jump, you know, this is one of the things we do in our work. A lot of the the um, guidance we have to give to organizations is you jump to solutions too quickly and then they don't work. And you wonder why, how come that didn't work? Well, because you really didn't understand the problem well enough. Agreed. You thought you knew the solution. You put a solution in place. It doesn't pan out. Maybe we should have done a little more depth, in depth uh, investigation of the problem first and then come up with a solution. OK, so questions on this. So as we said, oh, and this this um, model we call the transformational pyramid. We tried to work more syllables into that, but we couldn't. Um, so any time you are working toward um, change, actually even running an organization, you find that things work really well. If everybody has a common vision, we've 
articulated what our goals are to accomplish the vision. Each of us understands what our individual contributions and roles are. Um, we have sort of methods to do that well. And then, you know, then we can build strong relationships. When people start having bad relationships, it's not usually because, like I said, they have ill intent, but it's because one of these other layers is not well defined, right? So just if we think about going forward, whenever we get into disagreements, and I would say this is true in your board meetings, you know, go back to here, right? What is it we're trying to do? Patient safety, you know, safe practice of pharmacy. And if we all agree on that, then we can kind of work back to where do we have those common uh, points of agreement? And then we can talk about, okay, I have a different idea about what solution will work, but at least we can get there with a more solid foundation. So that's kind of a checklist that we always do. Maybe we need to go back to, okay, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish here? So then we can define the right solutions. Okay, just a little, little call for that. All right, so here's the, the crux of what we gathered from the assessment. Um, and this is the good stuff. So I told you I would give you good stuff. Um, a lot of progress, as we've seen, on the rules update, um, organization, navigation. So a lot's been accomplished. And the comment was made, um, you know, this, this rule or this rule re rewriting activity was something the board asked for, which is true, right? Most of you here or on the board were there in 2019, and that was the big message. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about rule updates, but had not made a lot of progress. And so this was the first time we worked with Board of Pharmacy, and that was a clear message. And you can see the evidence that that has happened in the chart that Rachel showed a few minutes ago. Um, staff member elevated. Um, so this is a, an achievement. We also, you know, a few things that came up in Death and Bridge Novels um, update. We've improved guidelines for pharmacist and technician, pharmacist and technician role responsibilities. Um, make a lot of value in, even though there's still some concerns about the renewal of uh, licenses for non-certified technicians. Um, it is addressing and helping to address the need for more people to do the work, right? Um, and self-service and improving um, ability of licensees to get information online. A lot of other agencies are working toward that, but not everybody's making progress. Um, but when you can, you know, apply modern technology so people don't have to call you and talk to somebody, they can actually go online and look it up. That really improves your efficiency. People nowadays expect that, right? You, you don't just compete with other agencies. You compete with businesses out there and they can provide that. And when you can't, you kind of look, which is trouble for government, right? Um, we're not as up to date as uh, as our partners in the private industry are. So that's a big deal. Um, enabling new dispensing technologies. Um, I think that, you know, the flip side of that is, is anybody actually using them yet? You know, how much is the technology being adopted? Um, so that would be a question, but certainly the allowing it to be used has been a, a success. And the efforts to deal with, you know, people not being able to find a pharmacy open or showing up and it's closed, and that's a big deal everywhere. Um, so that's good. So, I mean, these uh, comments on these, um, what we saw and heard, there, there are other things, but I think these were some of the things that stood out in terms of what you both board and staff have accomplished that's good. And a lot of detail missing here, obviously. Anyone have want to bring anything up? Anything missing? Was it the way just in case someone's, you know, reticent to speak, but working up the courage? All right. Well, let me continue that. So now into the, and so we took all the different perspectives in terms of the concerns and kind of boil it down into three main categories. And these kind of interact with each other, so they're not totally, um, you know, you can't totally peel them apart, but they kind of, these are themes we call them. Um, so as you've been updating rules and regulation, um, 
it's putting a lot of pressure on yourselves. Um, but I, I th the <clears throat> the tone is they, we've gotten away from how we support our practitioners and we're more concerned about setting guidelines on how they're supposed to work, right? So it's kind of like the shift has been away from service and support and more toward rule writing and rule definition. And so kind of getting back, maybe more back into balance, I don't want to predict the solutions, but the idea is that, you know, we're just being given rules, we're not being helped in supporting our practice. Um, and so the concern is that we're limiting the risk of the agency as we try to, you know, provide guidelines for safe practices, but is it having an effect on pharmacists and the people in the practice's ability to serve their customers, right? Um, we're essentially your customers, right? And I use the word customer being, you know, the people who are out there trying to get the medicine that they need. Let me stop on this. Comments, concerns, questions. I mean, this is very quick synopsis, but I just want to make sure there are any questions you have about this. Yes. Board member Vipperman, I think this is a huge concern, and I think it goes back to, you know, so many rules and being put in um, so quickly, and um, this is a concern for me, and I'm, I'm sure it's concern for other board members who have to, you know, read those time and time again and figure out what we what are we changing and, and whatnot. I think this is a, um, a huge role in uh, what we should be working on at this at this uh, meeting. So I uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, well, my, my pleasure. Um, so facilitator Andy, that really ties into the next one. That's why I said these things kind of have interaction between them. Um, work volume for the board and staff has I mean, I can't say <laughs> exponentially, but it's huge. So you remember the rule volume chart that we showed a few minutes ago, and you have a handout of the case numbers, yeah, <laughs> right? So case numbers, and what are the two primary things board meetings or agendas are devoted to? Rules and cases. Rules and cases. <laughs> so now you've got three-day meetings, you've got agendas that, you know, the um, board president can't really allow a lot of discussion time because you know we got to move on because we got you know 20 more rules we got to look at and each one's going to take some time to talk about so um and i i talked to um mr schnabel about this and i, I think he kind of agreed my perception my perception is it was like wanting to meet the demand that the board had provided the direction back in 2019 and sort of getting your head down and at some point kind of maybe going beyond what we should have been doing and being, but just the momentum is so great that, you know, there wasn't that sort of, let's kind of take our pedal, our foot off the gas a little bit because you kind of push too hard. So I think the idea is that there is an opportunity to recalibrate, if you will, because of the unintended consequences of that much volume that's come on to the staff, come on to and, and to the people in the field, right? This is, you know, from the associations, from you know, the people that we talk to and those of you who are in the practice, it's like how can we expect people, not just our board, but the people that we're regulating to be able to figure out what's going on. Um And then, you know, this then aggravates the challenge of communicating all the things that are going on. People are so busy that the opportunity to, to collaborate becomes more challenging. Um, there are some, you know, I think opportunities to facilitate more free communication within the staff. Um, and, you know, sort of remember my relationship thing was at the top. Well, if our if if one of the middle layers is, you know, we have so much work to do that we're just, you know, don't have a chance to even be 
one of the reasons I asked you to tell a personal thing, you know, a personal note about yourself, because we don't even have time to interact sort of as people, which really helps support that. So you know, I think you sort of add all these things up and it's created kind of a, a point. And, and Jamal said the first time we talked, I think we're kind of at an inflection point here. We've kind of been very ambitious, done a lot of stuff, but maybe need to recalibrate what we're doing so that we can communicate and collaborate better, so that we can, you know, issue changes in a way that's digestible for ourselves and for our constituents. And so we can make sure that we're balancing regulation and service and support. And every regulatory agency that I've ever worked with faces this paradoxical challenge of you're there to set rules and tell people, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, right? But at the same time, if you don't facilitate their work, you actually, you know, diminish the ability of that, that service to be provided. So, for example, I worked with um, the part of this uh, CMS, you know, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that regulated uh, senior care facilities, right? They would license them. Well, do we need more senior care capacity in America in 2023? This was a couple, three years ago. I think most of us would say yes, right? All those baby boomers are getting old. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at the same time, they don't want to just license anybody who you know has a checkbook and says, hey, I want to open a senior care home. So they have to make sure that they have you know, qualified, you know, well-managed senior care facilities. So what you're basically saying is, on the one hand, we're trying to not let people enter the business. On the other hand, we need more people to enter the business. So how do you balance that, you know, restriction, regulation, protection role with the, please come in and help take care of our seniors? So, you know, which is more important? Uh, this is this is the challenge you took on when you decided to be part of the board of pharmacy, right? <laughs> um, so I think that's kind of the tone that we see. You know, there was a lot of good direction, ambition, and effort. You know, putting all those rules in place been a huge work for everybody. Maybe a few months ago, saying maybe we should slow down a little bit might have been good, but you know, you are where you are now, and now the chance is to, to recalibrate that. So a few other kind of broad observations, you know, I kind of mentioned this before, but the strategic direction that the board has provided has been very helpful. And I think it's created much clearer understanding on the part of the staff, um, even though there's times where, you know, one board member will say something and it seems to contradict what they said at the last meeting. So, you know, it's it's not always perfectly consistent, but I think generally the direction's pretty clear and it's been very helpful. But again, more of this give and take. Maybe, you, you know, every meeting, like, are we getting out of whack here? Um, that would be good. Um, there are definitely some persistent issues. I mean, this idea of the rule changes and the cases, we heard that last year too, right? It was It's not new, it's just kind of new and plus this year. Um, still growing concern about safe practice conditions and what can this board do to address that? There's a question I think about, you know, what are our powers to manage that when our, you know, our, our um, statutory um, responsibilities don't necessarily directly address it. Um, from a service point of view, how can you advise your constituents on what the rules mean, even though you can't give them legal advice? I think finding some solution to that, this is again, kind of an opinion, um, would be helpful to try to resolve um, because it creates frustration and um, it makes it harder for you to do your jobs that people are not happy. Yod, right? Um, and then the other question about, um, you know, COVID, you know, it was um, Rahm Emanuel said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, <laughs> right? 
So what can we learn and sustain out of the emergency of COVID that really could be the new normal as opposed to just, you know, let's just get reset, go back to the way it was before. So I don't have a lot of evidence of that, but there's some concerns expressed about, you know, maybe we're, we should just leave it or, or tweak it, but not necessarily revert back to where things were. So those are um, kind of the, the sense that we got synthesizing a lot of different points of view. Not everybody said the same thing by any means. And, um, you know, not, every, not all these things are unanimous, but just the trend and the, the tone and the sort of uh, adding it all up. These are the things that came out. Hmm. Comments, questions, and this we're going to talk all about this. We're doing this now. So when we get into talking about specific topics, you'll have some of this as background. So I'll let Vashti talk about the DEI, but if there's a question beforehand, yes. Not really a question, Executive Director Fox. Um, I just want to just raise, um, particularly just in the last 10 days, um, trying to synthesize a lot of the information that's been coming to me as well. And, uh, what, what you have up there, uh, facilitator Pandy, that's going to take me a while to try. To, <laughs> um, me too. Is some of the, some of the things that I heard outside of this is um, from the governor's office and the governor's strategic initiatives and accountability measures that each agency, um, like we have a lot of reporting we have to do. And so how do we balance all those reporting items that we have to provide to the governor's office, particularly by next month mm -hmm. and the first quarter of 24 with leveraging a lot of the workload and stress that staff has currently. And what is the method of making sure that the board is in the know of what that workload strain on staff is and, and how has that been shared with the board? So the board understands and recognizes that. So when we talk about communication and collaboration from a board and staff perspective, um, there, there's a respect level on both sides that we know where we are. Um, so when I talked about the inflection point, that's, that's part of that piece. Um, and, and I think it would behoove us to, and I'm glad you raised the COVID, lessons learned over the last three years to be able to help us be whatever it is that we want to be when we grow up as a board of pharmacy, the next iteration of who we are and will be to the patients that we have in or mm -hmm. You raised that, um, Facilitator Pandy, one other item that we didn't include here, but because it wasn't sure about the report, but there's, um, you know, each agency, you know, has key performance metrics that the legislature asks you to report on. Um, and the latest data for the Board of Pharmacy is not good on the KPMs. Like 50% of the KPMs are in the red, which kind of indicates, you know, we've kind of gone to this point where, you know, we've kind of hit the mud, I think, is kind of the way of thinking. But, you know, we've accelerated so fast, we kind of kind of starting to, the, the engine's kind of vibrating, and, and that's where some of those KPMs, I think, are getting hurt. Some of it is more in the industry, but some of it is in terms of efficiency within the so opportunities, that's what they are, opportunities. Yes, Board Member Vipperman. Board Member Vipperman. So um, these are the over um, the overall observations. Are we going to have a chance to go over other things that um, are, is, are not on there, like um, diversity inclusion? Yes. Okay. And yes. Also, I I'm, also, I'm very, very um, interested in mental health. But, you know, we do nothing for... Our um, pharmacy's mental health. Do we know if there's anything uh, on the agenda for that? Yes. Yeah. So just so you'll just as a preview. So um, we're going to talk about the pillars. So you know, we've got the technicians and the communication and regulation, and all that. We're going to talk about kind of readjusting those a little bit. So you'll have to decide if you want to do that. And then our plan, this is why there's flip charts around the room, is to you for you all to go around kind of like we did have done before, but a little bit different. Um, and one of the topics will be, for now we're calling it people, right? So that would be the technicians, pharmacists, interns, whoever okay. needs okay. time. I think that would be the point yep. where that probably would be a, a question.
question to bring up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. One, one last thing, Se uh, Executive Director Fox, and I promise I'll be quiet after this. Um, when we go through the different breakout sessions, it, it would be helpful to understand what is the lens that we should be showing up in this space um, with each of the questions that you're going to have us meet. So it's, um, are we showing up with a racial equity, disability, anti-racism lens? Are we showing up with a lens um, looking at it from regulation, compliance, and patient care? Are we showing up from a lens what we've done, what we can do better? I just It would be helpful to understand as we go through and start fleshing out some of the equity, what's the lens that we're showing up in those spaces? Okay. So when we set up that that activity, um, make make sure that we've responded to that. Okay. I think we've tried to do it in a generic enough way that that those would be included, but make sure that um, you feel we've done that the right way. So we'll we'll give you some instructions on when we get into that that smaller group activity. It's not technically a breakout; it's just we're breaking into small groups. It'll all be in this room. Um, smaller groups. <laughs> Turn it over to my colleague facilitator Boyce. Facilitator Boyce. Um, so again, as I said, um, I am here to kind of speak to the DEI um, end of things. I do want to preface this. I know for a lot of us, given the world that we live in right now, you see DEI, you hear equity, and people get a little bit um, I am not here to tell you all that you are bad individuals or this is a bad organization, but every single one of us has room to grow. And as an organization, there's definitively room to grow. Um, I am not here to change your mind. I'm here to give you information and as staff and board, do with it what you will. Um, so um, as part of the kind of assessment process, I sat in with Pete on interviews with almost all of the board um, Karen, Joe, um, and then some external interested parties. So folks that were part of the different um, pharmacy boards um, and other people who kind of have a, a uh, interest in one way or another in the work that you all do as a, a board of pharmacy. Um, so we reviewed or I reviewed the guidance materials from the governor and a lot of pieces of information. Um, very extensive, exhaustive, and specific information that the governor provided, um, mostly um, coming from Governor Kate Brown, and um, Governor Kotek has continued most of that work um, and has signed on to uh, make sure that all of the different departments and organizations begin to incorporate this work into whatever that board, whatever that department is tasked to do. Um, and so um, I also reviewed the approved affirmative action plan that the board um, submitted. So um, the tools that were provided um, to DEI lead Karen um, were um, an organization assessment tool. This was created again by um, Governor Brown's um, Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and it's a comprehensive tool that was created by the Coalition of Communities of Color, which is a Portland organization, um, to support a full 360 view of public organizations and nonprofits. Um, so this assessment tool is broken down into 10 different strategies that pretty much apply to all organizations. So community, um, community engagement, um, hiring and firing, um, excuse me, accessibility, I'm going to list them all. Um, and it includes instructions on goal setting, um, measurement, evaluation, um, universal design, policies, budget, and policies. So I think a lot of people, when we think about equity, think of it as something else, right? When you are doing a budget, there is a way to think about equity. When you are doing hiring, obviously, there is a way to think about equity. When we are writing rules, there is a way to think about equity. It might be really big, it might be really small, but it is part of everyone's job, everyone's position to think about the ways in which you can create a more equitable, accessible um, organization. 
Um, so both obviously as board members and as staff, um, everyone has a role to play. It is everyone's responsibilities. Karen is the lead. Um, it is everyone's responsibility in whatever capacity that you show up in this room um, for this work to ensure that equity is part of it. So um, as I go to Director Fox, when you're like, are we gonna approach it this way with equity, with X, Y, and Z, from where I'm standing, yes to all of it. Yes, and. Um, I use yes, and a lot. Not a fan of but, because but cuts you off, right? Everything you say after but is in um, antithesis to what you previously said, right? So when we're thinking about all of this work and we're going out into these uh, breakout groups, yes, and, right? We have done this and we need to continue to do more. We have done this horribly and we have the potential to do it right. Right, so shifting our thinking from a deficit model to um, ensuring that we can use what we have. Right, everyone is in a different place as individuals. Um, the board is a different place as a collective. Staff is in a different place as a collective, and ensuring that we are looking at it from a place of, um, again, a place of where we can use our skills and um, and knowledge, um, and not from a place of we're bad, we've done it wrong, we don't know what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So again, the organizational assessment tool, um, it's comprehensive. It is not intended to be uh, completed in one sitting. I have gone through um, this activity with a previous organization that I work with here in Portland, um, and it has been, um, I do believe they're continuing to work on it, but they started the process in 2019. Um, they have a group of, I think, about 40 people who are working on it. Obviously, you have a smaller group. It can be done in smaller bites, but it is not something to be done once in one sitting. It is something that is to be done, completed, and then revisited at regular intervals. Um, so the next thing that was provided was the DEI action plan, again, from Governor Brown, um, and also um, supported by Governor Kotek. Um, and it's very similar to the organizational assessment tool. Um, it breaks it down in a different way, summaries of different strategies. Um, it also includes um, history about the state of Oregon. Um, if you don't know the history of Oregon, especially in um, the regards to racial equity, it impacts a lot of the rules that you all have in the first place to rewrite. Um, in addition to who lives here, who doesn't, who goes to school here, et cetera. And that does impact the work that you all do. Um, so I, I appreciate the, that it's in the action plan because I think it also helps frame why as a board, as a government institution, period, have the struggles that you have. Um, you cannot look at the future without looking at the past. Um, there are seven different, seven different appendices uh, within the DEI action plan from the governor that contains tools, checklists, definitions, um, that can help guide ongoing conversations. So there's a lot to pull from, um, from that. Um, and then the affirmative action report, um, excuse me. So it's a description of the goals, objectives um, from the governor's office, as well as recommendations, again, to the different departments. So some of the information in these three um, tools is repeated. I think it's all important and it's all important for us to hear more than once. Um, in addition to that, um, the demographic and retention data, employment and procurement follow-up and updates from the governor's office is also included in that report. Um, so kind of deliverables um, provided um, to uh, the governor by Oregon Board of Pharmacy um, is the affirmative action plan, not DNI plan. That was a mistake on my part. The affirmative action plan for 2023 to 2025, um, and it was approved by the governor's office back in the spring. Um, so that box is checked. <laughs> um, it exists. Um, it needs to be more robust. Um, it is adequate, but it is not sufficient in moving forward in your equity journey. So the governor has asked for all organizations to have a DEI plan. Um, and that is what you all should, would, are working on moving into the future. So facilitator voice, we skipped the break 
mm -hmm. and did some stuff. And I'm afraid people won't be hearing your next slide as well as they should. So maybe we take a 50 minute break now and then you come back and finish that after people have a chance to have more coffee, restroom, you know, hunt ducks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the camera is not good. <laughs> um, so is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, looking at my 1024. Yeah, it's 1024. So we'll give you an extra minute. So 15 minutes. 1040. Uh, 1040, yeah. 1040 will resume. I know.